what were your uh, initial thoughts when the schedule was released last night? I'll say this. First of all, uh, I think the SEC has done a nice job of taking a page from the NFL PR playbook. Uh, they have made themselves relevant year-round, especially this year. And I thought they did a great job with uh, creating some anticipation of that uh, schedule release show last night. It was uh, kind of fun. I think everybody was tuned in. Obviously, all eyes were on our conference. But uh, I think the thing that stood out to me about the schedule itself, uh, Hester and I actually talked about this on our show Monday morning, like, I was expecting these big stretches of, of games where teams were going to have four and five really difficult games in, in successive weeks. And as you looked at it, even though, you know, the, the Arkansas and Missouri schedules are really, really challenging and that everybody's going to have a tough go, I thought it was fairly equitably done in spreading out games and, and giving, you know, teams. I, I didn't see anything more than maybe three challenging games for any one team uh, in, in successive weeks, which I thought was a, a really good job of playing Jenga by the SEC offices. CD, you really didn't see that back-to-back stretch that we've talked about so many times for the contenders. The contender schedules really line up, uh, line up well when you look at Alabama, Florida, Georgia, LSU, the top contenders. I-, I think Georgia would probably have the biggest run when they've got in week two. They've got Auburn followed by Tennessee, Alabama, and Kentucky, and then the bye week before the cocktail party. So out of the contenders, do you think Georgia maybe has the toughest stretch considering – Tennessee and Kentucky are B football teams you know are going to play hard? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, again, that's based on our preseason expectation. And yeah. um, Tennessee obviously finished the season up strong, winning their last six ball games. Uh, Auburn, we have this perception of what they typically are, but uh, things could very well be different. But I do think as I look at the teams, you know, the two top teams that we perceive to be uh, uh, favorites in the West and the favorites in the East, uh, I, I do think that Georgia – may have had the toughest run. And, and for Florida fans, you know, being down here in Gainesville, that was the thing that everybody was kind of most upset about. This was supposed to be a year for, for Florida to have the advantage in scheduling with, with Georgia having Alabama in September. And now, uh, you know, with, with the schedule being realigned a little bit and having uh, a 10-game schedule for everybody uh, playing SEC opponents, it, it got more difficult for Florida with the addition of Texas A&M and uh, well, not Arkansas, but Texas A&M being added to the schedule. But I do think Florida fans take some solace in the fact that there is a little bit more challenging run for Georgia than there is uh, probably anybody else in the conference. Chris, what did you make of the report last week that when the, the coaches got together and talked about this, whatever, as a conference call or whatever, that uh, a number of coaches that uh, had a problem with the way that the SEC put this schedule together, in other words, they uh, – they wanted to know what the, the formula was, what rhyme or reason that they used to put this conference schedule together, and you can it's probably pretty easy to pick out who those coaches were. What you would you make of that? Well, I heard uh, rumors specifically about one guy, and uh, Esther, Esther and I have had uh, Eli Drinkwitz on our show before. He seems to be a very laid back, kind of easy going guy, but I heard he was one of those that was extremely hot about the way that the, the set, uh, uh, schedule shook out, uh, as he probably should be. I mean, at the same time. It, there's only a limited amount of combinations that you have when you have 13 other possible opponents and you're trying to make sure that everybody's having somewhat of a balanced schedule. Uh, it is going to be challenging for Arkansas. It is going to be challenging for Missouri, and they probably do have a little bit of a complaint. But at the same time, if you're Arkansas or Missouri, I'd rather have it happen this year than have it happen you know, in a couple of years when you have a, a, a team that you might be able to contend with and you're having to face that. Now, let me, let me look at it from a different perspective, too, because, Esther, you and I have, have talked about this. As players, I think we kind of relish that opportunity. Like, fans sitting around wringing their hands, oh, we got this tough schedule, we got to play these guys. Like, I think as players, we, we're open to that challenge. I, I look at Kentucky players, I bet they're excited about going to Tuscaloosa. I bet they're excited about playing one of the best programs in the history of college football and look at that as a real measuring stick opportunity to show that they're not just one of those mid-level teams that they are one that's ready to ascend into the upper echelon of the SEC. Chris, when you looked at this schedule, was there a team maybe both ways you thought was a contender and then because of the schedule change, maybe not a contender now, and then one that you didn't really think was a contender, but because of their schedule, they could make some noise? I don't necessarily think so. You know, as a Florida guy, you know, I, I was actually fairly pleased with the way the, the, the Florida schedule shook out. Um, you know, I, I look at one of the things that we all often heard, particularly in the 90s when I was at Florida, was Tennessee fans saying, well, if we played you guys at the end of the year, we'd beat you. You know, we always played them early in September. 
And, of course, the one year in 2001 when 9-11 happened and they kicked that game back to the end of the year, Tennessee came to the swamp in the last week of the season and, and beat Florida. So uh, I think that's one of the things that Tennessee fans are probably excited about. I can tell you this, us Florida boys don't like the idea of potentially going to the cold weather on December 5th to have to play up north. So that could be a little bit of a challenge for, for the Gators. But, um, you know, I, I, do, I don't think there's anybody that I would have necessarily eliminated because of the way the, the schedule kind of played out and vice versa, I don't think there's anybody. I really only think there's probably a handful of teams, uh, I'll say five, that I, I think could even contend to win uh, the conference this year, in my opinion. Now, I know you weren't extremely high on Texas A&M, but I do think Texas A&M, a lot of people looked at them and they had the hype because their schedule was going to be easier than it's been in the past yeah. because you take Clemson off and then some of your West games were at home. But they've got Week 2 Alabama, Week 3 Florida. I think people who thought Texas A&M was going to contend for the SEC – that's going to be a very difficult stretch. You got to go to Tuscaloosa, and then you got to play Florida at home back to back weeks. That might be the toughest two game stretch out of the whole schedule release to me. Yeah, you're right about that. And, and I guess the reason I didn't acknowledge that is because I didn't really consider Texas A&M to be a contender this year anyway. And I, I'm with you. I, I do know that everybody was pointing to year three in College Station for Jimbo Fisher to make that uh, that leap to the next level and 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 you know have to provide some return on investment for what they're paying him, but the uh, the schedule did get more difficult with the addition of Florida and Tennessee from the east and the way that it plays out with having to play against Alabama and Florida in back to back weeks there in, in early October uh, it's going to make it really challenging for them. But I just I have too many questions question marks about that team. You know I, I think Kellen Mond has teased us at times. He's he's shown that he can make tremendous throws. He's shown that he can create mismatches in the quarterback run game. But at times, they just leave you feeling disappointed as well. Like, and not not disappointed if you're an LSU fan, but you know, I thought they were going to provide some sort of competition for y'all's boys last year, and they just completely got walked over. So I am skeptical of of Texas A and M, and even more so because of the way the schedule plays out. Chris, now that we're looking at it, we can actually see ten SEC games on a schedule, and somebody with a powerful voice like Nick Saban comes in and says, "You know what? This is what." I've always wanted, and you get Reese Davis, who's a pretty powerful media voice, that says, you know what, this is what they ought to go to forever. You you feel any momentum, and I know we haven't played these games yet, any momentum that this could one day be a permanent thing? There's no question. I, I don't know how you go backwards from here. Like We've been clamoring for the last few years to eliminate FCS games. Those were just nothing more than money grabs for the, the athletic department. You know, we, We've talked about eliminating group of five games, like – Let's make it more competitive. Let's get a chance to rotate through and play some of those teams in our opposite divisions that we rarely get to see, and that's exactly what we're having the opportunity to do this year. We're renewing some, some rivalries, some games that, that we haven't had a chance to see in a while, and we're beefing up that schedule. Like I don't see how you go back from here, and I think in general in our society we've learned to adapt during this pandemic. Like We've made some changes out of necessity that are going to become the norm going forward. I don't think people are going to travel as much as they once did. I don't think people are going to commute to work the way that they once did because they're finding ways to, to, to do things differently out of necessity. And I think that's exactly what we're going to find with scheduling going forward, um, that this is now much more appealing. It makes every game matter more. I don't care about the idea like you know, that, that a team could be a national champion and have two losses. I know Hester doesn't care about that. So Not at all. I love I, it, I think, actually. <laughs> I think that's the thing that we're looking at. I wouldn't be surprised to see an SEC champion this year that has two losses. But I, I, I think the the product that's being put out there, uh, I think the opportunity is there to make more money uh, for the, the, the schools at the end of the day. And I do believe that this is going to be something that could push to, for the expansion of the college football playoffs, which I think we would all love and would provide even more money to uh, to the system. CD, before we get you out of here, I do want to ask you a question about your Florida Gators, Tony, Grimes, Copeland, and Carter all set out practice yesterday, kind of in this holding pattern for the Florida Gators. What's the latest there? Could potentially you miss out on three receivers and the very talented defensive end here? Well, the ironic part about it is that Kadarius Tony and Jacob Copeland a couple weeks ago were tweeting about the idea of sitting out and, and that it might be the safest thing to do, which I thought was nothing more than trying to draw attention to themselves and have people talk about whether or not they were going to play. Um, I do understand concerns of not playing, but handle that behind the scenes. Uh, but to me, the, the, the ironic part about it was Dan Mullen opened up practice yesterday and in his media uh, conference did acknowledge that there were four potential starters that were not at practice. 
and didn't even seem that panicked by it. That's the world we live in right now. Like, could you have imagined uh, Coach Miles or Coach Spurrier or Coach Saban like having four starters miss practice on the opening day of fall practice and and not be completely freaked out about it? Um, but I, I think that's the thing that these these athletic departments, these coaches, they have to walk a very fine line. Because you don't want to strong arm a player into playing, you don't want to make them feel like they were manipulated into playing. You want them to to come at their own free will and understanding the risks that are associated with it. So you do have to be very gentle about it. But I know you and I have talked about this before, Hester. Like our mindset was like, hey, I, I'm not missing a single rep, let alone right. a practice or a season. And uh, I think these guys will ultimately be there. But it is scary because three of those four guys that sat out are receivers. And let's not forget, Florida lost four of their top receivers last year. They were counting on Tony and Copeland uh, and Grimes to be the big-time uh, pass receivers coming into this season. It's the idea of having those players out not three weeks away from the opener, but five weeks away from the opener. Maybe a little bit of uh, that cushion has made them yeah. A, a, yeah. a little bit uh, – uh, a little bit uh, e- able to think uh, easier on that. Chris, we appreciate your time. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thanks, guys. Talk to you later.